Hello and welcome to Murder and Lies. I'm Christina Moore. Now today's case we're going to look at is the Anthony John Hardy case. Okay, so he was born in, in May 1951 in um, Burton on Trent in Staffordshire in England. Okay, so he is an English serial killer. Okay, now again before I even start, I think going any further, I should say that there is some content within this video that some people may find, you know upsetting okay so you know a bit of a warning there okay <coughs> so in um his crimes were between 2000 and 2002 and then he was arrested and then uh, his trial was in 2003 so in this time he killed three women and um what we know of okay but he is suspected of killing more women i think nine in total okay but the problem is with the other victims is that some were dumped into the Thames River and the problem with them with a body that's now immersed in water and for some time you can't get the DNA and you can't get the evidence you would have usually have had if like with certain of these bodies were placed in um, other areas of dump sites so he is suspected of other murders and um, the MO is the same apart from different dump sites, but there's no evidence to say it was him and he has never admitted it, okay? So um, for now, this is all we can talk about really is the, the three murders that he has now um, committed. So again, he is a serial um, killer and he was sentenced, I think in 2003, to, to three life sentences. But we'll go through that as we go along. But I'm gonna start with, with him as a child really because he was born, um, in um, Burton-upon-Trent and he came from a good family and there was seemingly nothing wrong as he was growing up there is no evidence of abuse there's no evidence of anything actually it was seemingly a very good upbringing he then went on to go to university um, and he'd done a degree in engineering he's an intelligent man and he'd done that degree at the Imperial College of London so a very good university okay and with that degree then after that degree he then became um, a, a manager of a very large company okay at the same time of going to university is where he met his wife okay and that marriage ended a little bit later on down the line so now we've got this man that seemingly has had a good childhood he's now gone to university he's got a good job from that as an as a, um, engineer um, he's also then married and now they consequently had um, three sons and one daughter, right? So, and I, the reason I'm sort of telling you is because as we go through down the line, you can see where some of this may have then added to this man's personality change and also then his diagnosis. But he was running a big company, probably with a lot of responsibility in this company. Then he's got four children at home, a wife, and he's all of a sudden, through his marriage, was quite good at first, but then once all this started happening, he sort of had a personality change, okay? He then became um, quite violent within the marriage, so domestic abuse was in this, this marriage. And then in 1982, he was actually arrested in Tasmania for trying to drown his wife, okay? Now, subsequently, them charges were dropped but it's just showing you that something has changed over these years, okay? To get in 1982, he is now trying to drown his wife. She then comes back and the abuse continues. She stayed with him for a good few years actually after that. But in the end, she divorced him and her reasons for divorcing it states on the, on the decree and I side that she divorced him through domestic violence, okay? So now you've got this man who has now not he's now lost his jobs, he's lost his wife, he's lost his children because of his own doing, right? He was um, quite violent, as I said, and so he's lost it. She has got no reason to stay with this man yeah. at all. So now he ends up in London and um, is living in hostels and on the streets. He's then being arrested for like theft charges and all this sort of stuff, you know, as I, you know, he's now an alcoholic, and then he's also now um, 
been diagnosed with bipolar and um, also um, he's a diabetic. Okay, so I think really we need to talk a little bit about bipolar uh, because, you know, it's in the manic phase of bipolar, okay, uh, it's common to experience feelings of heightened um, uh, sense. You know, it's, it's a it's a hyper it's a it's a manic state they're in. So their whole mind changes. They speak at a very fast pace and do everything at a very fast pace. And then uh, you know everything is extreme. But they also have then um, delusions and hallucinations they can get from this. And they are they're they're thinking is disturbed in such a way that it's very evident that something is not right okay and they're finding it then difficult to live okay in this manic state because the energy you know the not sleeping the energy it, it, it takes out on the body it is i think one of the probably the worst mental health diseases you can have disorders you can have alongside schizophrenia okay because it it, it 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 literally does something to the, to your brain that you cannot control you do and, and you are no longer the person you was okay so it's a terrible thing but also with bipolar you then have the lows so you go from this high up here and you drop then to this low very low manic depressive state where you want to kill yourself, you can't get out of bed, and all this sort of thing. Okay, so there's, you know, and there's a few different types of bipolar, and um, he really, um, he found it very difficult. And I think then again, drinking, and then being a diabetic as well. Okay, he, um, he was now in a mess. His life was now spiraling out of control. Okay, so the, the other thing, so we've said about the bipolar, which is bad enough. Then you put on top of that now that you've got um, diabetic, you're a diabetic and an alcoholic, okay? Now with a diabetic, especially in men, a lot of erectile dysfunction in a man. Now erectile dysfunction in a man can make the man feel even more depressed, okay? Because this man now has lost everything. He's lost his family, he's lost his jobs, He's living now a life on the streets of London, whether that's in a hostel overnight or on the streets. He's now suffering with bipolar and having these ups and downs, and some of these ups can last weeks, okay? So the man is exhausted, without a doubt, internally, his body now is exhausted. And now on top of that, he's got um, diabetic, he's a diabetic with erectional, um, erectional dysfunction, okay? So, um, and this, I think, you, you really comes into play later on when we discuss about the murders, okay? So, anyway, his life's out of control. And then in 1998, actually, it was reported, uh, a, 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 a street worker did report that he had raped her. Now, again, right, you've got this man now showing signs of all this mental health and everything else. He's living on the streets. He's now been arrested constantly for theft and different things, you know, uh, in London. He's now then been accused of rape by a prostitute. And again, they said there wasn't enough evidence. Now, the thing is when you have someone that works in that industry, is because, because you are selling yourself for money, it's then difficult to prove rape okay because if you've gone with this person and that is hard to prove that you haven't given your consent right but even so even whether you're a prostitute or not if you say no no is no and the law but the, the evidence you need to prove that someone that works in that industry has been raped by a client it's very very difficult and so this case then again fell by the wayside so there were chances here okay there were chances here this this man as i said is now spiraling okay okay so now let's look at this murders so the first murder was in january 2002 okay and 
um, the only reason the police found out about this murder was because a neighbour of Hardy's had had like acid and stuff put at her door and someone had wrote stuff on her door and been harassed and she knew it came from number four where Hardy lived so she'd rung the police because now it's very worrying you know you've got acid running down your door and stuff and you've got stuff wrote on your door and it, it was quite worrying so she rang the police and the police turned up and, and she told me they went to Hardy's flat number four and um I mean, I think the police knew from the minute the man opened the door that something wasn't right. Because inside this flat, okay, I think this flat was as disturbing as his brain at that time. It was a reflection, I think, of what was going on in his brain was wrote on these walls, you know, graffiti stuff and, and, and just it, 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 anybody that was trained in mental health, if they'd walked in that home, would have known something was going on because of of the look because usually especially things like that you know when you've got someone with these sort of disorders that can exhibit this sort of thing you you know he was he was going for an episode of something okay so anyway they questioned him and he's let them in to this flat <clears throat> but there was a bedroom door locked and he said, oh, I can't find the key and everything. They said, well, we need to look in the bedroom, you know, because we've had this complaint. And, um, you know, and he said, listen, I was drunk. I was really drunk and I don't even know what I did, but I probably did do it, right? So he admitted to the criminal damage and the, and the sort of <clears throat> antisocial behaviour on the neighbours across the hallway from him. So, but the police said, listen, we've, we need to look around. So, because that door's locked, we want to know why it's locked. So in the end, he let them in. And there on the bed is a dead body okay now the police again now arrest, arrest him on suspicion of murder because he said well i've been so drunk i don't even know how she got here that's how he was and um <laughs> it was uh, i think i think the police thought well they knew he'd murdered her right they knew he had but she was laying there, she wasn't dismembered, she wasn't, she was laying there naked, and again, she was a prostitute, and, um, you know, a sex worker, and um, she was 38, and her name was Sally White, actually, and, you know, but she was laying just on the bed, you know, and you, she could have died from natural causes, but anyway, so the forensic pathologist, okay, his name is Freddie Patel, now, he conducted the autopsy on her and the pathology and he stated that White had died from a heart attack to natural causes. So the police have arrested him on suspicion of murder but they couldn't now because this pathologist has said she didn't die of murder, she died of a heart attack, natural causes. So you think, okay, <laughs> And I think this is this is the problem with this case, and this is the other chances that were missed. Later, Patel um, he came under scrutiny a lot, not only for that, um, you know, how he diagnosed that murder with with being natural causes and a heart attack, but other murders, you know, that um, or other cases that he diagnosed as. And I think in two thousand nine, the death of um, uh, in Tomlinson, he put down to that so there was a lot of there was a lot of issues with this man okay and in the end anyway he was um, erased from the medical register okay and the general medical council um, no he could no longer practice medicine anyway in the United Kingdom but again though what this had done had given given Hardy not he, he wasn't now caught for a murder okay because this sort of come out later on so he wasn't really caught for a murder. But anyway, he pleaded guilty to a charge of criminal damage, this, that, and the other. And um, while in, whilst he was in, in custody, actually, he went to a, um, a psychiatric unit, mental hospital, psychiatric mental hospital, because I think even the police knew. Now, we have a lot of this with the police, that the police are not um, mental health trained. They have a little bit of training, 
because you know you you know they have to sometimes arrest people with mental health one for their own safety or the safety of others and then they take them to the um hospital to get you know seen and, and then whether they're going to be sectioned or released but it's not really for the police is it when you think now that the police you know are, you know yes they've gone into this room and, and and but it's the police have got a separate job to what people with mental health have got or psychiatric doctors have got so in this case i think the police did what they could okay they tried to arrest him for murder then you had a medical um, pathologist that was just no good and and really was then um took off the register and then you he had gone to a psychiatric unit and um he was released there on the 3rd of december 2002 so in november 2002 he was um in you know court and been and um, put in on remand on here to, to hold on under psychiatric reasons but then on the 30th of december that same year so weeks have only gone by it's only a few weeks have gone by um he's out okay so then we have um a homeless man okay walking around in um london as they do you know they're trying to find london is one of the most expensive places in the world to live and if you're homeless you're homeless and plus it's freezing cold now in december and they were searching for food okay in the bins they were out searching for food so um what what hardly had done with his victims the other two that you're now going to speak about is that he um would meet them again they were street workers prostitutes he would meet them and he would then take them back to this flat now i think even on entering this flat you would have um an idea that this man isn't right no matter what your job okay so they must have i think been quite worried the minute they walked in this flat now these girls these victims these next two victims which are the ones that we're really going to talk in detail a bit about now were um bridget mclannan and elizabeth valid now bridget was 34 and i think elizabeth was 29 okay both street walkers uh, street working girls and also um uh, you know lived in that local area they had families and stuff and and you know it doesn't matter why they was doing that job whether they chose to or whether circumstances led them to it you know that's the job they were doing and um unfortunately for them they met hardy so what he would do with the victims is take them into this flat and as i said before this flat you would know anyway something was wrong with me you walked in that flat and so he would actually then attack them quite quickly and kill them okay quite quickly now if he'd left it at that yes these girls are dead but it's what he does to them next he first um i think gets his hacksaw and he chops off their heads actually no he doesn't no he doesn't he what he does first is he kills them quickly he strips them he lays them on the bed taking and putting them in poses sexual poses pornographic poses Right, because don't forget, and this man, he cannot, um, he's got a, an erectile dysfunction, okay? So he can't perform that act. That's frustrating enough. Plus now everything else is going on in his mind. So what he does, he takes photographs, because he, there was a lot of pornographic photo, uh, uh, magazines and stuff around in that place anyway, in his flat anyway, but he takes his own now pornographic photographs of these girls does things to these girls that he couldn't do when they were alive all right so now um and that happened to both girls all right that part then what he does then with the bodies is bears chops their head off um with a hacksaw and then chops um the legs arms um you know everything so there's a torso so you've got the head the legs and a, and a torso and then he puts them in black bin bags now and then just outside his flats there's a load of bins of rubbish and he literally chucks them in the bin you know this is the mentality of this man so and again this is now we go back to um on the 30th of december this homeless man again this you know walking around london freezing cold loads of bins full overflowing with rubbish and he's thinking i need something to eat i'm gonna 
go through these bins. Well, lucky he did really, because if them bins had been empty, we'd never have known about these two bodies, but they wasn't, luckily. He's then found a torso and a leg, I think. He's found a few body parts, okay? He is so shocked, he's run off and called the police, and then the police have come, and then they found multiple body parts, okay? And then took them to the... Um, um, pathology and, and, and you know to the coroner and so now they can try and work out what's going on so they finally work out and they have a suspect because of his background Hardy's background of this last killing the member of the prostitute that was meant to have died then from natural causes and then he'd gone to um, a mental um, health facility and um, and then had been released. So now they're thinking, well, he lives in this block, and he this is now the block where all these bags have now been placed outside, and we need to find him. And um, he's actually then gone on the run. And he's, he's now on the run. And he was on the run for about a week, okay? Now, he because of then he's diabetic, he has to get insulin, because if he doesn't have insulin, he's going to die. So. There was evidence, I suppose, as well. You know, he's, he's gone, so now they're searching. They now know it's him, and they're now searching this house, and they've they found um, <laughs> bloodstains covered in this house. He's tried to clean it up. It's covered in bloodstains, blood everywhere, and especially in the bath. So he would take the victims to the bath, dismember them, and then get rid of them. So there was lots of evidence. And then, of course, he's gone on the run and they're searching for him. And so now they're looking for this man. And they look at CC cameras and they ring up and they different places. But there was an off-duty officer at Great Ormond Street in London. And um, he was sitting in the waiting room and he knew that they was looking for this man. And all of a sudden, Hardy turns up because he's waiting for his insulin. So the officer has quietly tried to inform, you know, other officers, bringing up that he's here. And then he goes, um, by this stage though, I think um, Hardy thinks, hmm, something's up here, and he starts to leave, okay? And he gets outside and he hides behind the bins outside of Great Ormond Street. Now this police officer has then followed him, okay? and. Um, really you've got to think about um, how he reacted at that time Hardy because when he realized he was going to get caught and he realized this man was then trying to hold him to arrest him he pulled out a knife and he stabbed the, the officer through the hand he also dislocated his eye I mean this was a very violent man okay he fought and how this officer actually fought him off uh, you know, and, and held him there until other officers arrived. I'm very surprised, but the man or the officer was very injured in doing that. But if you, if he hadn't have done that, he would have got away and God knows what else would have happened. So at that time then, Hardy was arrested and he was taken, he was taken then to the police station and, uh, you know, in the interview, he's just, doing no comment he wouldn't give any comment at all okay so then um the trial then was in november 2003 right but at this the site at this time again they've now put him in a psychiatric hospital right because you can't put this man in a prison one he's too violent two you can see that there is mental health there and you know he's clearly disturbed okay and needs help okay so the trial started, and at, before trial, sorry, as he was in the um, mental health facility, he was also then diagnosed with a personality disorder. Now, personality disorders, okay, are, again, um, you know, they, they, there's a couple of forms of personality disorder, and it's thought that he had the one that was, um, it's like um, antisocial, um, personality disorder and what it does it typically um, you have you have difficulty then controlling anger under this disorder you then blame others 
for your life. It's, you know, really blame. So you're very, very paranoid. It's everyone else's fault. This aggression, you're upsetting others with your behaviour. And I think probably with Hardy, he'd had this personality disorder and bipolar because usually you, 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 you have a mixture of, of um, different diagnoses with under mental health, especially when you have severe mental health as Hardy did. So I think he's always had that. Then you put on top of that the alcoholism and then you put on top of that then the diet, you know, he's a diabetic. And then this where he can't, he doesn't feel like he's a man. But now I think he's going for prostitutes because he thinks it's their fault, you know, this disorder he's got, this antisocial personal um, personality disorder, is about what he thinks others are done to his life. Okay, it's their fault. So I can't sleep with a prostitute. That's her fault. So that's where the photographs come in, the pornographic photographs where he's displayed these victims once they've been dead. Okay, for his own gratification because then he's on his own and he can imagine in his mind what he's doing to these women, okay? And then you have the dismemberment, which is him discarding them. You know, he discards them. They're no longer of use. He's got the photographs. He doesn't need anything else. So this is why he's chucking them in bins. They are absolutely worthless to him. So when you're talking about someone with severe mental health, where it will affect them to this level, where they have then probably no medication now ever will be able to bring this man back to some form of normality. It's gone too far. The brain can only take so much. And I think that's what's happened with him. But again, there was lots of different chances, not only for him to get some help, but also for the people around him. And, and that, you know, you know, there's a lot going on here where it could have, have been stopped. So anyway, he's finally caught his took in. He said, no, Joe, has gone to court. And in court, um, he was then sentenced. And I mean, don't forget, at first he, he yeah, said no comment and he pleaded not guilty and he's gone to court and literally within minutes of being in that courtroom in that dock, he changed his mind and just pled guilty. Right? So I, I don't think he could then cope with that as well. And I, you know, and then, you know, <laughs> You are um, thinking now, okay, now the judge is thinking, now what can I do? Because we know now this man can't go to prison. He couldn't go to a mainstream prison. For one, his own safety and the safety of others. Because this man would kill you, okay? So he had to then go to a psychiatric, uh, psychiatric facility and where the judge said, okay, that he needed to be... Um, in this place indefinitely okay so he didn't set a minimum tariff now again we come back to this tariffs don't we in english law you know we have tariffs so the minimum sentence in that would be placed and then you could go for parole after now this judge felt that um i think he's um i think he felt that there was no way because of this man of how he was and how you could see he was, and how that, that you know, we, d we don't, I don't think he thought he could ever be um, reformed in any way, okay? So he didn't put a tariff on there, and so then, um, again, as we've said in different cases, like Myra Hindley case, Myra Hindley case and, 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 and people like that, at this time in 2002, 2003, you know, the laws were changing, all right, so you had a Home Secretary that wanted to keep these criminals like this that were a danger to society in prison. But then you had the Human Rights Act and the European Court of Justice that, that are saying, no, we can't keep these people in. They should be allowed then to have a minimum term served and then be eligible for parole. Okay, but this judge was saying, no, this man, and I think... In these cases, when the judge is the one and the jury are the ones that have heard all the evidence, okay, every bit of evidence, right the way through, and don't forget, don't forget, um, Hardy would have had, you know, a defence team for him, but the prosecution is about 
sticking up for the people that I can't speak anymore and that is these three victims and I think they've done a very good job and I think they could see by um, Hardy's personality and how he formed that there was something really wrong. So in 2010 anyway, um, the Camden Ripper as he's known, um, he said it should never have been released, right? Because now he was waiting on a waiting list, I think, of about 700 other um, uh, defendants waiting to see about this law change of whether he then could be released or not, or could then, you know, apply for, a, a, have a lower tariff fitted and then apply for parole at some point. So there was quite a lot of people at this time waiting, okay, on this list to go. So, in 2010, in May 2010, don't forget, in 2003, Hardy was sentenced to three life sentences for the three murders, right? Don't forget, we also think there's other murders took place that we, there's not enough evidence then for this man to be charged with them. So, but in 2010, when all these tariffs were going on, the judge then came out and said again that um, even though these laws were coming in to where their minimum tariff would be set, he did not feel in any way, okay, that Hardy could ever be released from prison. And there's a few reasons for that because, you know, um, the, for one of these, it's an exceptional case this, I think, because you're talking about someone who the judge said was so deprived and that he'd done this, to, you know, and as I was explained before, he cut them up and took photos and this, that and the other. This was his own pleasure, okay, and discarded them bodies. And the judge sort of said the same thing, probably in a much better way than I've done it, by the way. But he did say in these exceptional circumstances of this case, and I think this is where these tariffs now come into play, of where we must think each criminal, each defendant, okay, has a set of circumstances that makes them do things, right? And if a person is so ill with mental health that by releasing them, they would put the public in danger, as it would, as the judge was saying, in Hardy's case, then that is an exceptional circumstance. And that, that's therefore that there should be no tariff set on them and they should remain in prison for the rest of their natural life. Now, I'm going to leave that up to you about what you think about this case, okay? Because the law's the law, okay? And I do the law, but I, the law's the law. But I do agree with this judge that every person has to be judged on what the facts of that case are, okay? And it is for the courts to decide, I think, you know, what to do. It's not for a home secretary or anyone else. To, it, the judges know what they're doing. They're well trained at what they're doing and they try. But under the law, they can only do what the law says they can do. You know, I, I, I would assume that most of these judges you know, would feel the same as you and me, but under the law, they have to stick with them sentences of the law. But this judge actually did say that this man should spend the rest of his life in prison, okay? So again, this has been the Anthony Hardy case, okay? AKA the Camden Ripper. Um, and again, London, England case. And do you know what? I, I don't know why this case hasn't had more publicity than it's had because it's a shocking case but then don't forget in it we've had pathologists that have been you know struck off the register okay we've had failings I think within mental health not because I think they meant to because when they released Hardy the first time within that you know few weeks of the murders you know he was to them not cured because you can't cure these diseases but you have you can manage them and then he would have been placed out into um, mental health community care which is again if you don't open the door they can't get in but some of the blame has to go onto Hardy himself because he didn't seek the help okay and that's maybe because he was already too far gone and he was then living this life you know he was in a hypo state he also had personality disorder, which was an antisocial personal uh, personality disorder, which changed his character, right? So I think the sentence for Hardy was correct. 
but I don't know why this case isn't is, isn't more well known because we can learn a lot from this case. We should learn a lot about how to not allow things to be left, you know, and some of these girls um, may have still been alive. And let's talk now, before we finish this case, about what you want to call them, street walkers or prostitutes or however you want to call them. All these people were victims, okay? They were victims, no matter what they do for a living, no matter what they dress like, what colour they are, what, what anything, it doesn't matter. These were victims of, of a terrible, terrible crime, okay? Terrible. And you hear this a lot when, when you know, when, about victimology is because it is part of their job to go off with people they don't know, okay? And this is why people like Hardy and others choose these victims because they feel, one, that they are easier to get because they're already willing to go with them no matter what. Then you have the other fault, well, people don't care so they're not gonna be looking, right? But people do care and people do look so I think there's a lot here, but a victim is a victim, no matter what age, no matter what they do. And so I think this is why this case should be told. One, because it highlights mental health, and not, listen, mental health, and we, we deal with it a lot in different crimes. And in the older crimes, you'll see, mental health wasn't even recognized. So you can tell certain things by their personalities, but it wasn't recognized, okay? As now we become 90s, you know, 2000s, you know, and beyond soon, we recognise that people with mental health need assistance. But the percentage of people with mental health that actually commit crimes like this is, is minuscule, it's tiny. Most people live and manage mental health and live good lives with mental health. All right, so this murder is not always about the mental health and that may not have been his only um, reasons why he done it. As I said, he's got bipolar, he's got personality um, disorder, um, and then he's also got an alcohol problem and probably some other substance abuse going on in there if he was living on them streets. Plus then he's got, um, he's taking insulin because he's now um, diabetic. So there was a lot of things to Hardy, but there is one thing that is clear. Hardy was a serial killer, okay? Killed up to nine women no three up to nine so no matter what his diagnosis is i believe that he's in a place where he belongs and i agree with this judge he should never been released but now i leave it up to you to see what you think about this case so anyway this has been the anthony hardy case and um, i hope you found this case interesting and um you know what to do i say it every time you know what to do. <laughs> um, you can follow us on um, Instagram and on Facebook. And don't forget, up in that corner there, laces put up there where you can click on MA sign and um, you know um, subscribe to us. It would be really good. And as I always say, you know, I like to have a chat about murder, right? So let's have a chat about murder. So leave some comments if you'd like. So anyway, until the next time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.